please be upstanding for the Bible. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. And a warm welcome again to the Reverend Mary McLaughlin from Money Ive, who is leading our worship this morning while Yanni is away. Now, uh, everything is as per the CFNs, I think, but Jill has asked me to highlight the proposed pop up shop in Dumfries on the 7th and 8th November for much needed church funds. They used to, it used to be a charity shop, but they're now pop up pre loved, etc. shops. But that's on the 7th and 8th of November in Oliver's The Bakers on the High Street. Now, does anyone know where we can acquire clothes rails or hangers for clothes? If you would think about that and ask people or think about where we may be able to get them and tell Jill or Gwen. There will also need to be lots of helpers on those two, two days. So if possible, please keep them free and join the happy bunch of sales assistants. I'll put up a rota with time zone. I think that would probably be the best, and people can put their names down. And there'll be a meeting about it here in church this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock to make more arrangements. So come along if you can. That's 7 o'clock this Tuesday. And finally, um, with regards to the food bank and the Harvest Thanksgiving, many thanks for all the, the food that was um, put out for food bank. It was great. It was very gratifying to take so much in last Tuesday to the the food bank in Dumfries. Many thanks. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you for your welcome. It's good to be back here with you again this week. And uh, let us worship God as we sing num hymn number 124. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, number 124. <laughs>
The psalmist says, Your word is everlasting, Lord. It is firmly fixed in heaven. Your faithfulness endures for all generations. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to bring you our worship. Help us through this time together to recognize that you are here, to realize how many blessings we have received and to understand how much you love us. Teach us to listen to your voice and to follow where you lead, to love one another and to live as your family, to be the people you would have us be. I accept our praise for everything you are, our gratitude for everything you have given, and our sorrow for everything we have done wrong. Give us a sense of your presence in all things, and assure us of your forgiveness and strength to amend our ways. Grant us wisdom to know your will, courage to accept your guidance, and faith to build your kingdom. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. God is love. Through Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Take hold of this forgiveness and live your life in the power of the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We turn to hymn number 181, For the Beauty of the Earth, number 181.
excuse me if I sit down through the hymns. I've not been very well last night, but I'm fine now, but I just rest through the hymns, <laughs> just that so you know what's happening. Andy, thank you. Our first reading this morning is Psalm 91, verses 1 to 6, and then verses 14 to 16. God, a protector. Whoever goes to the Lord for safety, whoever remains under the protection of the Almighty, can say to him, You are my defender and protector. You are my God. In you I trust he will keep you safe from all hidden dangers and from all deadly diseases. He will cover you with his wings. You will be safe in his care. His faithfulness will protect and defend you. We need not fear any dangers at night or sudden attacks during the day, nor the plagues that strike in the dark or the evils that kill in daylight. Verse 14 to 16. God says, I will save those who love me. I will protect those who acknowledge me as Lord. When they call to me, I will answer them. When they are in trouble, I will be with them. I will rescue them and honor them. I will reward them with long life. I will save them. Our second reading... It's First Timothy, verse, verses 6 to 19. This can be found in page 266 of the Pew Bible. False teachings and true riches. Well, religion does make a person very rich if he is satisfied with what he has. What did we bring into this world? Nothing. What can we take out of the world? Nothing. So then, if you have food and clothes, that should be enough for us. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and are caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful desires, which pull them down to ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a source of of all kinds of evil, some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. <clears throat> Personal instructions. But you, man of God, avoid all these things. Strive for righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Run your best in the place of faith and with eternal life for yourself. For it, is, for it was to this life that God called when you firmly possessed, professed your faith before many witnesses. Before God, who, who gives life to all things, and before Jesus Christ, who firmly professed his faith before Pontius Pilate, I command to you to obey your orders and keep them faithfully until the day when the Lord Jesus Christ will appear. His appearing will be brought about at the right time by God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He alone is immortal. He lives in the light that no one can approach. No one has ever seen him. No one can ever see him. To him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. Command those who are rich in the things of this life, not to be proud, but to place their hope not in such things and uncertain things as riches, but in God, who generously gives us everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share with others. And in this way they will store up for themselves a treasure which will be a solid foundation for the future, and then they will be able to win 
life which is true life. Here ended the lessons. Thank you, Andy. For our gospel reading, we turn to Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. The rich man and Lazarus. Hear again the word of God. There was once a rich man who dressed in the most expensive clothes and lived in great luxury every day. There was also a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. He used to be brought to the rich man's door, hoping to eat the bits of food that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the feast in heaven. The rich man died and was buried, and in Hades, where he was in great pain, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. So he called out, Father Abraham, take pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue because I'm in great pain in this fire. But Abraham said, Remember, my son, that in your lifetime you were given all the good things, while Lazarus got all the bad things, and now he's enjoying himself here while you are in pain. Besides all that, there is a deep pit lying between us, so that those who want to cross over from here to you cannot do so, nor can anyone cross over from us to where you are. The rich man said, then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, where I have five brothers. Let him go and warn them so that they, at least, will not come to this place of pain. Abraham said, your brothers have Moses and the prophets to warn them. Your brothers should listen to what they say. The rich man answered, that is not enough, Father Abraham, but if someone to arise from the dead and go to them, they would turn from their sins. But Abraham said, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone was to rise from death. Amen. May God bless to us these readings from his holy word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Our next hymn is number 544, When I Needed a Neighbor, Were You There? Number 544.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Maker and Redeemer. Amen. Every day we have choices to make. What clothes we're going to put on in the morning, what we're going to eat, what we're going to do, when we go shopping, what we're going to buy. We have choices to make all the time. Simple yeah. things that don't matter that much. They don't make a difference on the big scene. But some of our choices are very important choices. So today, this is what we're going to be considering. So our reading from St. Luke's Gospel this morning tells us about a rich man whose name we don't know and a beggar whose name we know to be Lazarus. I don't think he's the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead whose sisters were Mary and Martha. I think this is another Lazarus. So Lazarus sat at the gates to the rich man's house every day, waiting for someone to give him some food. Just some crumbs would do anything. But we're not told if he even got the crumbs, but he was a beggar and he was physically in a bad, bad way with sores on his skin. And the rich man lived in a sumptuous house he wore purple and linen, just like the clothes of a prince, because we know that purple was such an expensive dye. It was only the very rich that could afford purple cloth. He had plenty of food, and he shared none of it with the beggar. He also had brothers who were equally rich and selfish. And they all lived life to the full, but they never gave to God, or trust God, or gave him a thought. They didn't think of Lazarus either. Then we're told that both men died, both the rich man and Lazarus. And we're told that Lazarus went to be beside Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. And the rich man went to a place of torment. We are told that they could see each other across a great chasm that neither of them were able to cross. And however much the rich man pleaded with Abraham, there was to be no leniency. Him and his family and friends had had their chance to believe in God and follow his example and had rejected it. They had kept their wealth to themselves and Lazarus had not been helped. Lazarus, meanwhile, must have been a man who had faith, who trusted God despite his hardship. And then we balance this story with the readings from Psalms and Paul's letter to Timothy. The psalmist writes of his trust in God because he knows he dwells in the shelter of the Most High. He rests in the shelter of the Almighty God. He knows the Lord God is his refuge and fortress. And because of this, the Lord God, who knows the psalmist, loves him and acknowledges him and will rescue him and protect him when he calls on God, he is answered. God will be with him in trouble and shows the psalmist salvation. This reflects Lazarus's relationship to God from that previous reading. And that's an amazing response from God towards someone who loves and trusts him. Those promises from God towards the psalmist are promises for us too. If we dwell and rest and trust, if we love God and acknowledge God, for if we do, God will respond to us in the same way as he did to the psalmist, 
with the answers that he'll be a presence with us in a time of trouble, that he will deliver us if we honour him and we will be shown our salvation. And that's such a promise for us to hold on to if only we put our trust in God. And as we turn to the first letter of Paul to Timothy, Timothy, who he was training up to take over his own work, we saw Paul encouraging his good friend on how to live his spiritual life. And what does God require of us? Timothy was asked to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Does that remind you of something we talked about last week? A rather like the fruit of the Holy Spirit that we thought about last week. So how do we measure up on these aspects of our life? Can we, like Timothy, say that we pursue these attitudes? Do we walk closely with God through his son Jesus Christ and with the help and encouragement of the Holy Spirit? Or do we stumble and fall at the first hurdle? Paul doesn't stop there. Paul tells Timothy to fight the good fight of faith and don't let anyone put you down. Don't be overwhelmed by the ways of the world, but stay close to Jesus and to take hold of life, not just his own earthly life, but eternal life, the gift from God for those who believe in Jesus Christ and salvation through him. But going back to Luke, were these the things that the rich man did here? Did he grasp the free gift of salvation and eternal life given to us through Jesus Christ? He certainly realized the predicament he was in on the wrong side of that chasm. And he had this conversation with Abraham. Send someone to my brothers so that they don't end up in this place of pain. And Abraham's response was that they have Moses and the prophets to warn them. They should listen. And that's the same as the rich man that's there now suffering. He couldn't have been listening to Moses and the prophets and what they had to say to him. And the rich man replied, it's not enough. Moses and the prophets is not enough. But if someone was to rise from death and go and tell them, then surely they would turn away from their sins. And Abraham's final comment was, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen to a man who rises from death. That's in the middle of Luke. That's before Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. All right? But still... The rich man and Abraham are looking forward to that, aren't they? They can see that that, uh, you know, that maybe that's what we need is somebody that will die and be raised to the life. Then, then we believe. It's like, how many proofs do we need? But Abraham said, no, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen to anyone like Jesus. So no wealth and fine clothes, no exotic lifestyle can be fulfilling on its own. <coughs> no self-sufficiency in building your own happiness is ultimately satisfying or worth much in the big picture of eternity. Jesus, the man who did rise from the dead, is the man we believe about the good news of the gift of eternal life with God our Father. The better way is trusting God, loving God, acknowledging God, pursuing a life of kindness, faith and godliness, a life that will then have so much to offer. For it's only through the salvation that Jesus died to make possible for us 
and our acceptance of Jesus as our Lord and Saviour that can transform our lives and put us right with God. It makes us his children, heirs with Jesus Christ for all eternity in God's glorious presence. Which would you choose? We have choices. The gift is free. It's God who gives life in all its fullness. The opportunity and the alternatives are there for us. But do we individually know that God is our refuge and fortress? Can we say that we put all our trust in him? For God is looking for acknowledgement from us and a desire to be his children and for him to be our heavenly father. What greater gift can we ever be offered? Only eternal life in his presence as a reward of pursuing a godly, righteous and faithful life. And I've got a little illustration to show what we've been thinking about. No kids but here, but we're all children at heart. Paper magic. So I've got a plain piece of paper and I'm going to store, tell a story with this piece of paper. And let's see what happens. So there was once a rich man who was never happy. So he decided to buy a sailing boat. And he sailed everywhere and he was really happy for a while and then he became bored and unhappy again. So he went out and he bought a house. If you've seen this before, you're being very patient. <laughs> so he went out and bought a house. It's a better house than a sailing ship, isn't it? There we are. And he was happy with his house for a short time, but then he was unhappy again. He decided to go out and buy a plane. That's a good one, that's all right. There's a house, now we're going to have a plane. Well, we know how to make aeroplanes, don't we? I don't think it was ever on the curriculum at school, but we still learned how to do them, didn't we? Right. There. Let me fold down the wings. Oops. Right. And he flew all over the world and he saw some very exciting places. That's why we like going on holidays abroad and to new places, isn't it? We like the new things. You know what? He flew all over the world and then he got bored again. All these worldly things didn't suit him. And then a friend told him about Jesus, that it was a free gift and that it would bring him happiness always that he would never get bored of it right let's see what we're going to do now so uh -uh. so he tore the wings off his airplane which gets a bit tricky when it gets to the thick bit uh, he got rid of his airplane Let's see if we can do this one too. That's right. And da 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 da. It's worked. <laughs> That's quite smart. <laughs> You see it, Mary? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Right. And we got across. And then this friend explained to this rich man 
about how Jesus gave up everything for God. Not just some of his things, but Jesus gave up everything. He even gave up his life and he died on a cross. But you know what? Because he gave up everything, God made him alive again and gave him a crown. And he made Jesus king over all kings and Lord over all lords. And that's what this symbol of the cross means. Some of us maybe wear a cross around our necks sometimes. And the symbol of the cross means that if we give up everything, give everything to God, give all of our lives to live for God, God will give us a prize, a great reward in the end. We'll be on the right side of that chasm with God and with Jesus Christ. Suddenly, the man with the sailboat, the house and the aeroplane understood that and he gave up all these things. And that was when he found true happiness. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have cars and planes and go on big holidays, but it's the position we give them in our lives. It all falls into place when Jesus is first in our lives. And that's when that man found true happiness, even without fancy things like cars and planes and houses. He was happy because he knew Jesus loved him and that he would give him a reward too. So our choices are all a matter of priority. Put Jesus first and all these other things fall into place. Doesn't mean we can't have homes and cars and things. Don't think of any of us have got an airplane, have we? But there's the cross. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. We sing number 352, Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, number 352. <coughs>
your offerings will now be received. us pray. Loving God, we bring these gifts as a small way of thanking you for all you have given and as an outward expression of all we want to offer you in return. We bring with them ourselves and our life together, our prayers and our worship, our words and our deeds, our living and our loving. We bring ourselves in grateful praise. Lord Jesus Christ, we remember that before you died, you prayed not for yourself, but for others, and not simply for your followers, but for all people everywhere. You offered your life, not just for the chosen few, but for the whole world. Your desire being that everyone should come to know your love for themselves. So now we pray for our world of so much good and yet so much evil, so much joy yet so much sorrow. Remembering especially those who live in troubled places of the world through conflict or nat natural disasters. Draw close, Father, to all those who have lost loved ones and wrap them in your loving embrace. We pray for those who have plenty and those who have little, those for whom life brings pleasure and those for whom it brings pain. Help us to consider what we do with our wealth when we remember those who have nothing. We remember all who celebrate and all who mourn, all who look forward with confidence and all who view the future with dread, come among us and establish your kingdom. We pray for those in our community who are sick at home or in hospital, for those who are grieving the sudden and unexpected loss of loved ones. Draw close to them and comfort them. Bring healing and wholeness and a real sense of your everlasting peace and presence surrounding them at all times. We bless you, Lord God, for all your saints who have departed this life in the faith of Jesus Christ, especially those whom we remember today with love, and we pray that we may lead faithful and godly lives in this world, and finally share with all the saints in everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Our hymn is number 110, 
Glory be to God the Father, number 110. Go from here in peace to love and serve the Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore.